All right, I have the privilege of uh, introducing our next speaker, Steve Elkins. He grew up in the Dallas area. He's been married to Marcy for 42 years in June. They have two daughters, one son, and nine grandkids. Steve has a bachelor's from uh, SMU and a THM from Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, Steve and Marcy ministered with uh, Young Life in East Dallas for over 30 years, working to reach high school students with the saving message of Jesus. Steve has also served as pastor with Believer's Bible Church in Corsicana, Texas, and with Capel Bible Fellowship here in the Dallas area. And Steve will be teaching the uh, pastoral ministries course this fall at the GS School and Seminary. And Steve has recently uh, reprinted his book, The Roman Road, uh, Revisited, which is a great book on Romans for lay people. It is also one of the few books that has an endorsement from uh, Zane Hodges. So let's give Steve a warm welcome. Thanks, Mike. And it's such a privilege to be with all of you here because I regard you, every year I come, I regard you as God's choice, holy, special, uh, most humble servants. And it's just a blessing to be here. Well, a father said to his son one day, Son, remember, the smart man doubts everything. Only a fool is 100% certain of anything. To which the son said, Dad, are you sure about that? <laughs> now, in GES, if we believe that we get eternal life by believing Jesus, that all we have to do is believe him for the promise of eternal life, doesn't it make sense that we understand what the concept of believe means, at least the essential nature of belief? In the mid-1980s, I believe that faith could contain doubt and still be faith. As a result, I thought that trust was actually a better word for believe uh, when sharing the gospel. In fact, yesterday in that funeral, sadly, uh, the preacher said, it's, it's not believe, the demons believe, you've got to trust. And I you know, was cringing in my seat thinking, boy, I should send him this paper. We're going to talk about a conversation I had with Zane Hodges in around 1987 for 40 hours over a two-week period debating this because I was determined faith has a volitional element. It doesn't require certainty. You could have doubt. And uh, as a result, he, and I think the Holy Spirit used him, swayed me on my view of faith to believe like he does. Now I not only believe that faith can have 100% certainty, but if it never was 100% certain, it was never saving faith to begin with. If you believe that faith or belief can be anything less than 100% certainty, then after today's talk, I hope you'll be 100% certain that faith, saving faith, requires certainty. One, the top reason current theologians deny the certainty of faith. In preparing for this talk, I read several books from theologians and philosophers, all touting that faith or belief is volitional. That is, it's an act of the will. It's something one can choose. It's a decision. And they all say it's something less than certainty. Books like Wandering Toward God, Finding Faith Amidst Doubts and Big Questions. That's by a philosophy teacher at DBU. Doubting, Growing Through the Uncertainties of Faith by Alistair McGrath. He believes uh, faith is actually an uncertain thing. Benefit of the Doubt, Breaking the Idol of Certainty by Gregory Boyd. He attacks our position as faith is certainty as being an idol. Uh, doubt, Faith, and Certainty as if they're different things. Faith isn't certainty by Anthony Thistleton. Knowing and growing in the assurance of faith. Joel Beatty is a famous Reformed writer that writes on this subject of assurance from a Reformed perspective. But no wonder his audiences fail to get at assurance because he doesn't believe faith is assurance. Uh, one by reductionist philosopher at Asbury named Kevin Klinghorn. The decision of faith. Can Christian beliefs be freely chosen? All these writers have been swayed by the postmodern idea that there is no objective truth. Some, less severe, will say that we can only have certainty of mathematical and self-evident truths, but regarding other things like matters related to history or objective religious or moral statements, we cannot have certainty at best. We can only have, quote, a high degree of confidence. Not only downplaying any idea that belief could be certainty, instead they insist on the nobility of doubt, how doubt is a good thing, and that the biblical idea of faith or belief is trust even in the midst of doubt. But faith is definitely not certainty for these fellows. Mm -hmm. Now, before going any further and later making the case that the biblical idea of belief most certainly is certainty, of course we believe that a believer could come to doubt. We can never lose our, I mean, excuse me, we can even lose our faith. First Timothy alone, just in that little book, gives several reasons 
of how a believer can lose their faith. They can give up a clear conscience. They can fall in love with money. They can fall in love or get uh, sidetracked with false teaching. The writer of Hebrews warns nearly 50 times in that great book not to fall away, turn away, drift away, slip away, go astray, or be carried away. Not to fall, fail, develop a hardened heart or an evil heart of unbelief or not endure. Not to fall back, draw back, depart or come short, neglect so great a salvation or forsake the congregation or refuse him who speaks from heaven. These are all his terms. And the book makes clear that even committed believers to whom he is writing can be in danger of losing their faith. John the Baptist, the greatest man outside of our Lord who ever lived, at the end of his life came to doubt. The Apostle Paul realized doubt and disbelief were even a possibility for himself when he said, if we, including me, are faithless. So when one says faith can have doubt at the same time be faith, and of course we'll say it can't be, that doesn't mean a believer can't go on afterwards to doubt. They can. They can even die in their doubt and disbelief. They're still saved, of course, because in the gospel, Jesus never promises that our faith is indefectible, only that the eternal life that got at one instant of faith can't be destroyed or taken away. Now, what we'll be saying is simply biblically, at the moment of believing something, one can't at the same time be doubting it or else he is not said to be believing, at least how the Bible terms it. We'll see that in just a minute. But these authors I've mentioned are quick to say outside of mathematical and self-evident certainties, absolute certainty is impossible. Alistair McGrath, like these others, just conveniently changes the lexical meanings of faith to fit his formula. He says, yet absolute certainty is actually reserved for a very small class of beliefs. For example, things that are self-evident and capable of being logically demonstrated by proposition statements. Christianity does not concern logical proposition or self-evident truth. That's a big lie. Mm -hmm. But then he says, such as 2 plus 2 equal 4. The things in life that really matter, underline that because we'll come back to it in a second, cannot be proven with certainty. He then quotes Alfred Lord Tennyson. For nothing worthy proving can be proven, nor yet disproven. Wherefore thou be wise, cleave ever to the sunnier side of doubt, as if doubt's a good thing. Now concerning the important issues of life, God's existence, human destiny, and so forth, McGrath says, these cannot be proved with total certainty. At best, we can hope to know them as probably true. There will always be an element of doubt in any statement that goes beyond the world of logic and self-evident propositions. That's postmodernism. And here's where he radically changes the basic, universally accepted meaning of the word faith. He says anyone who wants to talk about the meaning of life, the gospel, biblical issues, etc., has to make statements that rest on faith, not absolute certainty anyway, God is not a proposition, he's a person. We say he's changed the meaning of faith because he's made faith to be something less than absolute certainty. We'll show from the Bible that can't be. McGrath goes on. To believe in God demands an act of faith. It's not based on absolute certainty, nor can be. To accept Jesus, dema to accept Jesus demands a leap of faith. It rests on faith that uh, nobody can prove with absolute certainty that Jesus is the Son of God, the risen Savior of humanity. The decision, whatever it may be, rests on faith. Notice McGrath uh, uses the word decision to talk about the act of faith. For him, it's not a responsio pacifum. He and uh, every one of these Reformed Arminian authors depart from Calvin and Luther and make faith an act rather than a passive response. These writers each assume, without proving that faith or belief is a decision, like in the concept of trust, where one can make a choice of his own volition to place his faith in someone or something, or whatever he likes. We hope to show that this is a fatal error in Reformed thinking, and frankly, in the thinking of a vast majority of evangelicals and Catholic, Catholics both, about the nature of faith or belief, that it's volitional or voluntaristic, an act of the will, a choice, a decision. These writers all to a person make this grave error, even though much of recent philosophical ink has been spilt by Richard Swinburne and others, proving convincingly that faith is not a choice or an act of the will. We'll talk about that later. But because of accepting the premise that faith is a choice, it leads to and inevitably involves that one's belief could be in something less than certain, and therefore making any hope for objective assurance of salvation not only elusive, but actually impossible. Here's the logic. My belief is volitional, that is, it's a choice or act of the will. Two, I choose to believe things that aren't certain, therefore, I can't be certain about the uncertain things I believe. Or, 
using McGrath's words echoed by others. Absolute certainty of the quote important things is impossible. My important beliefs are only in uncertain things. Therefore, I can't be certain of what I believe. All these well-published authors agree. One can only have a high degree of confidence, not certainty. And they each extol the virtues of trust amidst doubt and taking a leap, which for each of them, that's what faith is, a leap. While some of these writers say the certainty of belief is a possibility only for the naive, others like Gregory Boyd, in benefit of the doubt, breaking the idol of certainty, rule out certainty altogether. He says such certainty of belief is ignorant, idolatrous, ill-focused, and results in a faith built on a house of cards. Such certainty is impossible. So, according to these writers, what is faith or belief if it's not certainty? Beaky, McGrath, and others just echo the old saw of Puritanism as stated by Burkhoff, that one of the three elements of faith, you might have heard this before, in addition to a census and notitia, is the third element, fiducia, which they say involves a volitional element one's choosing to appropriate. And what they all mean by this is that a, quote, second step is necessary in believing the gospel. That is, faith in the sense of persuasion, conviction, assent, illumination isn't enough. One must go beyond just being persuaded of the truth to appropriating it with a volitional act of the will, a decision. And this they call trust. Now, I hesitated to put this book up because I don't think these writers have been so influenced by the postmodern uh, people as the other writers. But sadly, in this book, written by Free Grace Authors, A Defense of Free Grace Theology, Chapter 3 by Dave Anderson is titled, The Faith That Saves. Anderson gives his total endorsement of Burkhoff's version of faith, the typical reform view, in particular that faith includes a volitional element. Nor is Anderson just trying to write ironically because he told me in a private conversation in 2000 at a wedding that, quote, Zane had caved to the Calvinist on his belief that faith is just persuasion and a passive response. That's ironic. One, since Zane had always held this position on faith, so he didn't cave. And two, that Zane knew that Luther and Calvin's position on the nature of faith were the same as his. But it actually, but it's actually Anderson's view that faith requires volition and a decision, which totally caves to modern reform theology and Calvinism. Anderson says, my view is essentially following Burkhoff's definition of faith, a reform scholar that many other reform scholars like to reference. Citing Burkhoff with approval, he says, a volitional element, fiducia. This is the crowning element of faith. Faith is not merely a matter of the intellect or even the intellect and emotions combined. It is also a matter of the will. The third element consists in a personal trust in Christ as Savior and Lord, a recognition and appropriation of Christ as the source of pardon and of spiritual life. And then he even cites Hodges as using these words, trust and appropriation. But this is an absolutely false use of Hodges' words. Hodges was very clear, and Anderson knew this because we talked about it, that Hodges felt that the simple passive response of being persuaded or convicted to the truth of Jesus' words in the gospel by itself and that alone was what appropriated the truth of the gospel. Hodges very much was opposed to, more than any other writer I've ever known, the Burkhoff reformed idea that a, quote, second step or volitional step of trust was also required in believing. You need look no further than Hodge's YouTube talk presented in GS conference 1997 entitled Assurances of the Essence of Saving Faith or the, the 1998 GES journal article with that same title and then other stuff that Hodges talked about. He was very open about this. The second step that's produced when one insists that belief is a volitional trust held by all the reformed writers and sadly many in the so-called free grace camp was also at the heart of the antinomian controversy in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the early 1600s. There, in contrast to her Puritan accusers, including John Winthrop, her own pastor who becomes uh, governor of Massachusetts, and John Cotton, uh, her pastor, Ann Hutchinson remained resolute that at the moment of being persuaded to the truth of the gospel, did you hear that? At that very moment, not one second later, the person was regenerated and justified. Because of this view, she was dubbed as preaching free grace. I don't know that that's the origin of the title free grace, but uh, it's one of the earliest times it was used. Evidently, we've broadened that blessed moniker free grace to include those today who don't hold to assurance being of the essence of saving faith. In my opinion, only those who hold this view should rightfully be called free grace. That's a paper for another day. 
The mildest of her accusers was her own pastor, John Cotton. He maintained that such mere persuasion was not enough to be saved, but that one had to exhibit, quote, at least a second step of volitionally trusting the promise. But such thinking of these Puritans, that there had to be evidences to prove that faith really existed, and at a bare minimum, the, quote, second step of volitional trust, while agreeing perfectly with the Westminster Confession of Faith and modern Calvinism, it was actually in sharp contrast to Calvin and Luther. Calvin and Luther both believed faith was essentially passive, something that happened to a person, not something they did. They used words like persuasion, conviction, confidence, illumination, assurance, assent, and certitude as synonyms for belief. Calvin and Luther both felt that faith was non-voluntaristic, that is, no volitional or decisional element was involved whatsoever. Requiring any steps to the gospel, even just the one second step of a seemingly good thing like volitional trust, actually denies the gospel promise and undermines assurance. More about that in a second. McGrath represents the rest of these modern authors when he says, Faith is basically the resolve to live our lives on the assumption that certain things are true and trustworthy. No, we don't know them to be true. We have to assume that they are. And the confident assurance that they are true and trustworthy and that one day we will know with absolute certainty that they are true and trustworthy. Faith is a big decision, committing yourself to God. But McGrath's postmodernism and homemade definition of faith prevent any hope of absolute certainty. Now, you can't have it, only when you get to heaven. In the meantime, you just have to assume it's true and decide to commit yourself to God. For McGrath and others, faith is a resolve. It's a leap, a decision, a commitment, a being determined to live, quote, as though certain things were true, like John 3.16. But you can't be absolutely certain of them yet. That's faith for McGrath and these other writers. Unlike McGrath, when Luther or Calvin, Zane or Bob, most importantly, when the Bible uses this phrase confident assurance, we mean absolute certainty and not some degree of confidence. Like in expounding Abraham's justifying faith in Genesis 15, 6, Paul describes it in Romans as Abraham did not doubt, the main Greek word for doubt, diakrino, did not doubt in unbelief, apistia, that's what doubt is. It's not pistis, it's apistis, disbelief. Rather, being fully convinced, fully persuaded, play Raphael, that what he promised he was also able to perform. Abraham's belief was one of absolute certainty, not trust with a measure of doubt, which Paul says right there is not belief, but unbelief. McGrath is actually mild compared to some of these other writers when he says faith is a big decision, a committing yourself to God. The others say things like faith is being in a, quote, covenantal relationship, whatever that is with God, evidenced in things like repentance, obedience, perseverance, living a holy life, and whatever the case, faith is not a one-time act. So now they've cleverly untethered faith and belief from its lexical and biblical moorings, that is, from merely being persuaded that a statement or proposition is true, to having to evidence itself in all sorts of subjective works. Now, they can say, like my friend who so loves the Westminster Confession of Faith, and he's trying to find agreement between us, he says, Steve, We believe you're saved by faith alone, too. But they've redefined faith. They're using the same terms, not the same uh, dictionary. Two, reasons we know that biblically faith includes certainty. A, because biblically faith and doubt are mutually exclusive. One needs no other evidence for proving biblically that faith and belief require certainty than the many New Testament verses where faith and belief are set as opposites to doubt. Like we just saw in Romans 4.20, that Abraham did not doubt in unbelief, and that's what faith is, unbelief, but was fully convinced. Biblically, faith and doubt are polar opposites. For instance, these verses, oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? If you have faith and do not doubt, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes. He who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. And maybe the granddaddy clearest, strongest verse of all is James 1.6. For after having said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously. Then he says, let him ask in faith without any doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Not let that man expect he'll receive anything from the Lord, being an unstable uh, man, uh, double-minded un- a man, unstable in all his ways. Biblical faith requires certainty. There might be levels of doubt, but there are no levels of certainty not 98 or 50 percent. We'll talk about legal certainty in my breakout session. In the Bible, one either believes something and is therefore certain of it, or he is doubting 
and not certain. Doubt is not a lesser degree of belief. It is disbelief in the Bible. Biblically, faith and doubt cannot exist about the same thing at the same time. A believer can come to doubt. We're not talking about that. But at the moment of believing something, one is not doubting it, or else, biblically, he's not believing it. Now, oftentimes, when I'm training people in the gospel, like a new member's class or young life leaders, I'll talk about how in the gospel of John, the divinely given gospel tract, one gets eternal life by simply believing that Jesus is the Christ. Then we'll expound on John 11, where it's explained what it means to be savingly believe that Jesus is the Christ. It means to believe that he's the one who gives eternal life to whomever believes him for it. And then I'll say there are three implications in these dozens of evangelistic verses throughout John. Not just three elements, there are that, those two, believe, Jesus, eternal life. But three implications. First, I need to believe that Jesus, I need to believe Jesus, that all I need to do is believe him and I have eternal life. Not one time in John does Jesus ever say, mm -hmm. believe in me and right. anything. Second, I need to believe that what I get when I believe is eternal life, everlasting life that can never stop. If I think it can stop, inevitably I'm bringing good works into the gospel formula. And further, I'm not understanding the gospel promise to have believed it. It's eternal life. Third, I need to believe that when I believe I have eternal life at that moment, I don't need to wait to see if it produces works or fruits. All of the Johannine verses say, whoever believes in me has right now eternal life. And then I make a very big point. So biblically, if I'm believing him for this promise, then I know I have eternal everlasting life or else I'm not believing him. If I'm believing him, I know I have eternal life. If I don't know it, I'm not believing him. Then I'll tack on. So not only is eternal security part and parcel of the gospel, namely that's the promise that you're believing Jesus for, but so is assurance. It's in the very word faith itself. Faith is assurance. So Jesus can say, most assuredly I say to you, Whoever believes in me has everlasting life. So biblical usage of the terms faith, belief, believe are decisive in understanding that biblically to believe something means to be certain of it. It means to have no doubts of it or a set of Abraham's belief to be fully convinced, fully persuaded. It's this very issue, according to R.T. Kendall and St. Hodges Bow, that they believe is the biggest reason by far so many within Christendom lack assurance of salvation. That person may have fallen... Uh, volitionally trusted and made a decision, but they were never fully convinced or persuaded to begin with. They trusted maybe, but never believed. While trust can mean belief in some contexts, for sure, if it's anything less than certainty or being fully persuaded without doubt, it doesn't measure up to the biblical words, both in the Old and New Testaments, for believe, the words that are used in all of the gospel passages. Let's look at the lexical meanings for these words. Among reasons we know that faith includes certainty is B, because of the lexical meanings of pertinent words for faith and belief. Namely, Amon in the Old Testament and translated in the Septuagint as pistis and pistuo, and those are the words in the New Testament as well. Before looking at the assortment of Old Testament words for trust, which don't measure up to believe, let's say up front that the Old Testament word for believe is Amon. Amon is used 96 times in the Old Testament. It is never an act of the will. It is always simply a passive response of believing or not believing a statement or a proposition. It's always translated in the Septuagint from which Jesus and the Apostles exclusively quote from. By the common New Testament salvation words for faith or belief, pistis or pistuo. We've already seen those particular words can never contain doubt, only certainty. If there's doubt, there's not pistis and pistuo. If there's belief, there can be no doubt. And importantly, Ammon is used in the prototypical verse on justification, Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham believed Ammon, or in the Septuagint, Pastuo, believed the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. Of course, as we're saying it always does, it's used there in connection with him believing a proposition, namely, that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Coming to find out in Galatians that he understood on this occasion that the Gentiles, that's what the word nations is, the Gentiles would be justified by faith. So Abraham had much more soteriological understanding and believed more New Testament type saving truth than is often thought. In its 96 Old Testament uses, it normally means believe or believed and is virtually always translated by pastuo. And in its few adverbial uses, where it means sure, secure, assured, true, certain, or verified, it's still always translated by pastuo or the adverb pistos which means faithful, trustworthy, sure, worthy of belief. Amon, most certainly, 
is a one-to-one -one equivalent or correspondent to the pistis pistil family. By the way, the English word believe is also a one-to-one -one correspondent to pistuo. However, in English, where the illocutionary force or inflection uh, is used, it could refer to something less than certainty. If I say, Joe, I believe I'll be there by 1030, the inflection means I think I will be, but I'm not sure. However, there is no extent usage in the ancient world of pistuo or pistis where it has that kind of nuance. You either pistuo something or you don't. If you do, then you're certain that of that something. If you're doubting, as we saw in those many New Testament verses, then you're not having pistis, you're not believing it, you're not having faith. As a noun, amon refers to something that is sure, reliable, steadfast, certain, true. In other words, like pistis is used even in the New Testament in its objective sense. Sometimes pistis is translated evidence or proof. And so amon has that ability to something that elicits pistuo. And like pistis or pistuo, there is no occasion in the Old Testament of Ammon having any volitional element to it. But there are any number of Hebrew words in the Old Testament used for trust, which all contain not only a volitional element, but allow for doubt at the same time as the trust. We have plenty of words like that in English as well, uh, conveying the idea of having trust and doubt at the same time about the same thing. Let's say if I go repelling. Interestingly, most of these books use repelling as an illustration. I actually repel. I used to own all of our equipment. We took Young Life trips, uh, you know, to Enchanted Rock and other places. Okay. So, I don't have to have 100% certainty that the rope will hold me to repel. I don't have to have 100% certainty the anchor, uh, everything's anchored properly, or the carabiners are going to work, or that the Lord's going to get me down unscathed. I simply need to trust the rope. I need to assume that everything's anchored properly. I need to rely on the carabiners, or rest in the competence of the belayers, or hope that the Lord will get me through. You, you get the idea, there are many other words. I might have probability certainty or statistical certainty, but I don't have, personally, 100% certainty. You might have, but I don't, because I know too many real life horror stories, even at Young Life camps, where things went awry in repelling. Yet it's precisely that kind of trust that these Lordship and sometimes free grace writers extol as saving. Now, of course, to say 100% certainty is a tautology. There are no degrees of certainty. We'll talk about that again, as I said, in legal certainty in, in the breakout session. As Zane used to like to say about belief, you're either certain of something or you're not. There can be varying degrees of doubt, but no varying degrees of certainty. But by taking the definition of faith as they do, not only do these writers maintain that one can be eternally saved without being certain, Conversely, listen to this, all of them also say to a person, faith is certainty by itself is not enough to save. You have to evidence that trust in all kinds of various ways, the minimum of which, like Ann Hutchinson's pastor, making a volitional choice to will to trust. Yeah. So here are some of the many Old Testament words for trust that all involve something short of certainty. And in fact, they're noble because they imply trust in the midst of doubt or trust when facing uncertainties, and they also require or imply a necessary volitional decisional act of the will. Now, I used all of these words with Zane in our debate those many years ago, but he quickly brushed them off by simply saying these weren't the words, Amon, Pistis, or Pistuo, that are used in all the salvation passages and which have their well-established meanings of certainty. Mm -hmm. All these words for trust have vivid word pictures behind them. Look at the word pictures as we read through them that bring out the volitional element. Words like hasut, to take refuge. Mipta, the act of confiding in, trust in, reliance, having complete confidence. Masa, refuge, shelter, turning to someone for help. You see a volitional idea. Bata, to throw, lean on, hence to trust, put one's hope and confidence in, to rely on, be secure, to cause to rely on. This is the word throughout Psalm 22 of Jesus during his dark hours of the passion, having to choose to trust to rely on, to throw himself on the Lord, to have to even remind himself of reasons to trust when the temptation was so strong not to. Galal, to roll, roll away, move by turning or rotating, to wallow. You certainly see a volitional, at least psychological volitional element in this. Hill, whirl, dance, ride. Uh, it's a word used to be in labor, hence to wait, hope in, turn to. Demim. Be motionless, still, quiet, rigid, rest. Obviously, 
It's a psychological choice to choose to rest when you're uncertain or fearful of something. But you can do it, maybe, with the Lord's help. You call to hope, cause to hope, wait expectantly, take refuge, recos, to trust in, put one's trust in, rely on, passa, to seek and take refuge, find and go to a safe place for shelter, to flee, etc. All these words are translated to trust, rely on, most often to put one's trust in, to hope in, to depend on, etc. While they are extremely virtuous and every believer should learn to choose to trust and rest in, rely on the Lord, to turn to Him, to take refuge in Him, they are quite in contrast to the passive and certain nature both of Amon and Pastuo word groups. Mm. All these words we just looked at include volition and trust in the midst of doubt in debatably wonderful things. But insofar as they are intended to mean something short of certainty, they should not be used in connection to believing the gospel promise, and in the Bible they aren't. 3. One can't choose to believe what he knows isn't true. A. While one can trust, that is, choose to trust what he knows might not be true or certain, one can't believe what he knows, in fact, to not be true. B. Philosophers call this direct doxastic voluntarism. Direct doxastic voluntarism is the idea that at any given moment, one can't choose to believe what he knows isn't true. We use this in class all the time, but if I were to offer you a million dollars, as if I had it, to believe that there's a pink elephant dancing behind me right now, no matter how hard you choose and try to believe, you can't believe it. However, while direct doxastic voluntarism can't happen, the philosophers all say indirect doxastic voluntarism can. That is, our desires and what we want to believe can play a great part in our coming to believe something of which we're not yet convinced. For instance, the person who wants to believe that John 3.16 is true, but she can't. Maybe she has intellectual problems with the Jesus' historical statements or with the resurrection, or maybe there's interior reasons he or she can't even put their finger on or describe that they have. They want to believe it, but they just can't. Then we might say to them, God is a rewarder of those who seek him. If anyone's willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching. Uh, certainly we might say, if you read the book of John with an open mind, we believe you'll come to faith. And so these philosophers would say, while the person can't willfully change their belief in that instant, he or she can, with his will, choose to do certain things that put him or her in a better posture to come to faith. He can study certain evidences and avoid others. He can pray, uh, seek counsel, and so forth. In the case of telling them just to read John, they might need to read it several times, we believe, just like with so many of the characters Jesus evangelizes in that great book, think of Nathaniel or the woman at the well, that the Holy Spirit has self-authenticating hooks in how that book is written that bring people to faith in Christ. Certainly, as Jesus commands each to believe, it's a command. Commands imply ought, and ought implies ability. Then we believe each one can believe. And as John promises, whosoever wills, whosoever desires or wants to, can come and take of the water of life freely. Freely, the word dorian doesn't just mean free without cost, but it means free without cause as well. In other words, belief is a free act. In the debate I had with Zane many years ago, he informed me that just wanting the water or desiring it is not enough. You still have to come and take the water, says John, and you do that by believing. But that begs the question, how can one believe? How can one become certain of what he's not sure of at the present? Well, didn't you just say read the book of John? Yes, but let's talk about what has to happen even then, in that instant, for one to cross from the threshold of unbelief to belief. Four. But how can one have faith, a faith that is certain? Let's repeat. If one means by trusting Christ, taking him at his word, that would be fine. That is belief. Oftentimes a conscious or willful trust is a result of an already passive certainty or belief that, that came before it. Great. There's no second step involved in that or requirement of any kind in addition to just believing. Trust is involved in it. But concerning the gospel, if by trust we mean anything less than certainty, then we're not calling people to believe, but to doubt. And remember, Romans 4, in Romans 4.20, doubt is not a weak form of belief. It is disbelief. In regard to the gospel, doubt is not good, and it's not saving. Remember James' words about the person who doubts? Let not that man expect to receive anything from the Lord. Anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable and all his ways. Same at this point. 
Uh, some at this point might be saying, gee, even in this room, I'm not sure if I've ever been certain. Maybe I've only believed with something short of uh, certainty. How can I be certain? How can anyone be certain? First, by realizing that faith or belief is a divine illumination. It'll help matters greatly if we'll see that faith in the gospel, though it's the same kind of faith we use in everyday life, like to believe China exists or 2 plus 2 is 4, it's available to anyone who would want it, but it's impossible apart from divine illumination. The moment of faith is not an act of the will. While our wills can be involved, certainly, as we've been saying, in our coming to faith, the precise moment of faith itself is not an act of the will. This is seen not just in philosophical arguments like doxastic voluntarism, but in verses like John 1.13. All of us can probably quote John 1.12 that we're born into the family of God the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But in 113, he caveats, and he says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. It's not of the will, mm -hmm. but of God, that is of God's will, like James 118, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. No, the precise moment of coming to faith is not an act of the will, the human will, but it is an act of God's will. Like when Jesus says to Peter in his response that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. One of Zane's favorite verses on this was 2 Corinthians 4. Paul has just said, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, underline that, yeah. who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Now, we know from passages like Matthew 13, where Jesus also talks about those who are blinded, quote unquote, to his teachings. It's because they have closed their own eyes and are unwilling to turn and come to him so that they may be healed and that they may see. Make no mistake, our blindness before coming to faith is in accord with our own willful blindness. But that just also happens to cooperate with the God of this age who is actively trying to blind people. But Paul said just before this, that whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So with our wills, as we've been saying, we can turn to the Lord, seek him, study the evidence Jesus promises and so forth. But still something has to happen to create certainty. What is it? And here's the verse that Zane would cite over and over. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what has to happen. No doubt the Lord always uses his word, spoken directly at times like to Abraham or Paul on the Damascus road, but normally today simply through his scriptures. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But it still requires a miraculous illuminating fiat on God's part to see it as true. When he says, let there be light in our hearts, that's when we believe. And it's a self-evident type of certainty that needs no other proofs. For instance, you sitting in this room know with certainty right now that the lights are on unless you're blind. You know they're on. And it's with this same kind of very certainty that one sees and believes the gospel message is true. And unlike most, as we've seen in the evangelical scholarly world, it's a faith with 100% certainty and no doubt at all. How did it come about? Whether we used our wills in seeking and praying and reading, or whether we used our wills to be running 180 <laughs> degrees the opposite direction like yeah. Nebuchadnezzar or the Apostle Paul when he was Saul. Uh, remember in Romans it says, I'll be found even by those who don't seek me. Yeah. Either way, it was by God's divine illumination in our hearts. That's why the Hebrew writer uses these great words to describe one's coming to faith. He says, when you were illuminated, when you were enlightened, like Cornelius in Acts 10, there was no altar call or requirement or second step of trust. Rather, the moment they heard and were persuaded, that's when they believed and were saved. It wasn't something they did. It's something that happened. It was a divine illumination. Conclusion. First, we saw that biblically belief requires certainty and can have no doubt. While belief includes trust, the concept of trust uh, and the biblical words used for trust often don't amount to the certainty contained in the concept of belief in the Bible. In the gospel, we are called to believe Christ's promise. The concept of choosing to trust what one actually might be unsure of doesn't measure up. 
nor are we ever to insinuate that mere passive belief or persuasion isn't enough by adding a, quote, second step of volitional trust also being required. While trust in the midst of doubt can be a very noble thing, especially in the Christian life, as we saw, biblically, if one is doubting, he is not believing. In fact, doubt is disbelief, according to the Bible, especially in regard to the gospel promise. Remember Romans 4.20. The, unto the promise of God, Abraham did not doubt and disbelieve, but was fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. So as noble as trusting is in other areas concerning the gospel, let's not call people to doubt, but to believe, to be fully convinced, fully persuaded. And once they're persuaded, let's not do the really foolish thing of contradicting the promise that belief is not enough and they still need to voluntarily or volitionally trust. Belief includes trust, but not vice versa, necessarily. Maybe you heard about the fellow who said, I doubt that whiskey's the answer, but it's worth a shot. Isn't that what we do when we present the gospel and we indicate that something less than certainty is okay? Uh, we think Jesus is the answer. He's worth a shot. Give him a chance. You know, take the risk. Take the leap. No, we need to call people to believe, not to doubt. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, here's a question. Do you believe in some form of unconditional election or irresistible grace in the way you understand 2 Corinthians 4.4? 4? Uh, I don't think I want to use those terms at all. <laughs> I don't, and Zane didn't have a problem either with the idea of election according to middle knowledge or according to knowledge and that it's totally compatible with free will and our responsibilities to seek the Lord and so forth. So I, I don't have a, a problem or conflict in my mind about it. And I know mainly in GES, it seems like now there's more of the view of election as toward service. And that's fine too. I, I like middle knowledge, but however. Okay, I've got two questions on Mark 9.24. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Great. It says, can you speak to the passage where it appears faith and unbelief coexist? Yeah, that's great. That's a great. Passage. We'll talk about this in my breakout uh, somewhat extensively. But on that verse in particular, the man says he believes. I believe. What did he believe? Well, we know he at least believed that Jesus could cast the demon out of his son because he already did it. But what did Jesus say just before this? He said, to him, talk about circular reasoning. He says, to him who believes... All things are possible to him who believes. Now the man says, I believe, you know, I believe you for what you've just done. I want to believe you for more. And this is Zane's position too on, there are many verses, and we'll talk about it in our breakout tomorrow, that might indicate levels of faith that, you know, you could be, we'll talk about legal certainty too tomorrow. Good. But uh, but Zane's view was that these deal primarily with coming to know more things. Yes, you can strengthen your faith, but you, you already believe you were already sure or it wasn't faith. Now you can strengthen it by learning more of the Bible, more promises, and that buttresses it against the doubts that might come up later and so forth. But it doesn't mean that there are levels of belief. Zane was very strong. There are no levels of certainty, no levels of belief. Levels of doubt, not of belief. Okay, uh, next question. When a new believer claims to believe or just says they believe in Jesus for eternal life, maybe they use that exact language, do you recommend verifying the person really understands what they're saying? Yeah, like Mike said earlier, the different situations require different tact maybe, but you don't know this person, or maybe they're kind of young, you're not sure how clear they are on saying it. They could have just parroted it back to you. Right. And so, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's great to explore it a little more and, and even come at different angles to make sure they're understanding. I remember one time Zane used to say there are people who say I'm safe for today, but they don't yeah. believe they're saved forever. Right. And so he wants to make sure they understand it's forever. Yep. yep. Okay, here's another one. Would it be a volitional decision to reject eternal life? 
Yeah, there's no question. You, With our wills, we can uh, suspend belief at any time. We can choose not to believe something, even though the evidence is staring us straight in the face. Zane used that illustration about suppose there's a car wreck outside and uh, you know, his uncle was killed, maybe, and so somebody, he didn't say uncle, I'm making that up, <laughs> but somebody comes in and says, Zane, uh, Jim just got killed in the car wreck out there. Well, Zane can suspend belief, you know, and if he needs to, he could say, well, he could be telling a joke here, you know, who knows. But then when he goes and sees that Jim was killed, or whatever the guy's name was, that Jim was killed, then, then he has to believe it. Yeah, in Acts 13, 46 is where Paul says, you judge yourselves yeah. unworthy of eternal life. Right, right. And with our wills, as we said repeatedly, we can seek the Lord and do things that can put us in a posture to come to faith. It's just Zane's belief in mind that uh, the moment of faith itself is a divine illumination. All right, here's a tough one. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to speak to a postmodern unbeliever? That's a person who believes you can't be sure of anything. Yeah. Let alone yeah. your eternal destiny. You can't be yeah. sure of anything. Yeah. And by the way, this is being taught at leading seminaries in yeah. the United States today. Yeah, I know there are some churches that actually have apologist ministers now. And this would be a question for them because yeah. they can give great detail. But obviously, postmodernism is self-defeating on its face because when they say you can't know anything, that has to apply to the statement they just made, kind of like the father and son story so it's got to you've got to start there probably but but with the younger generation i don't know that that's appealing yeah. either you know i don't know if it'll dent, dent put a dent in them yeah but it seems to me it's helpful to point people to the scripture yep and say that's either true or it's not true you may say no there's a third option but yeah and there's a famous preacher today that i thought was essentially free grace back in the day and he's saying don't say, even as preachers, don't say the scriptures say or yeah. the Bible says. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding. You know, Je I mean, Jesus did it. And, yeah. yeah, you're supposed to say some guy named yeah. Paul, yeah. <laughs> some guy named Pete. Uh, okay, here's an online question. We'll end with this. Can a person have assurance by simply asking God for it? You know, by this person says, do I believe in Jesus for eternal life? Asking God, do I believe that? Well, okay, I, I'm not sure I understand it totally. I'm but not sure I do either. There's, anybody can have assurance uh, that's based on what they're hearing. Like, say, the Islam person, Muslim person has reasons to have assurance they're going to be in heaven, blah, blah, blah. The issue is, is there an objective basis for it and that's where we come back to the word of God again and of course in the gospel they do have to believe in Jesus for the promise of eternal life to have objective assurance of their salvation and how many things is that <laughs> three. two three <laughs> okay thank you so thank much you. just give them a hand